My name's Annette Serkham. Um, I'm a security architect at the Met Office. My, in a past life, about five years ago, I completed a master's here at Plymouth University. So thank you for Plymouth University for organising the event and also to, for Plymouth City Council. The talk today is around collaborative cybersecurity, so thinking about some slightly different approaches of, of assuring third party suppliers <coughs> utilising some attachery modelling. Uh, this is a brief agenda of what I'll cover, but basically I'm looking at um, looking at a bit about agile working, a bit about third party risk, and then a, some more detail about my experiences of working with attack trees to, to try and elicit requirements as part of workshops and some lessons we learned. So the Met Office is part of UK government. Um, we've got about 2,000 employees. We're all civil servants. Um, uh, the, our owning department is Bayes, um, so we, and we also used to be part of the MOD, but we do a lot of work with a number of big um, government departments, but numerous other departments as well. Um, we're a world-leading science organisation, so we do collaborative work with the many universities and with people across the world. Uh, but the bit that I work in is actually called an area called a business group, which is where we do our commercial business. So we, do, we have a lot of different customers from retail companies to energy companies, nuclear, offshore oil and gas, aviation. There's, there's numerous examples that we work with and we provide solutions for, should I say. We also have quite a large international um, role. So we're part of, part of the World Meteorological Organization, which means that we share data across the world with many other different countries. We're also um, one of the only like, high area, um, in the only organizations that provide world area forecasts for aviation as well. So this slide here is just to give you a bit of a summary about the bit that I'm going to talk about today, which is around our um, business group platform. So we've got an area of the organisation we're calling business group, which is basically a semi-autonomous area of the business, which is doing our commercial offerings. At the moment, everything is, is within the central Met Office, and we've got um, supercomputer, one of the biggest supercomputers in the world. We've got observations coming in from all over the place. The video would have shown a nice video of that, but that's not going to work. We've, and we've also recently acquired some, some direct connects straight into some cloud services, so we can push some of this model and some of this data into another environment, which then my area within the business group can make use of this. Now uh, we've designed a, a new platform which we've separated into different capabilities and the reason I'm talking about these is because each of these capabilities is having a different supplier normally um, who's leading those capabilities and then as part of that overall platform we'll then deliver services to our various different customers so the ones I was talking about earlier with aviation, oil and gas, everything like that. So I'm going to quickly go through a little bit around Agile working. So Agile is clearly not a new thing. I was looking the other day, and I think I attended an Agile course 10 years ago, but certainly it's been around a long time. Um, the Agile Manifesto was in 2001, so that's 17 years ago now. But um, I'll go into some of the challenges around the security side of it in the future, but the, in a minute. The collaborative multidisciplinary teams are also not new, but they're something that people are implementing more and more and seem to work really well. So it's, it's an approach that we're going using more and more in different contexts as well as just software development. So some of the challenges that I see around agile security and and trying to secure this type of environment is sometimes what, what's been spoken about here a lot, which is around resources and skills, like everyone here. Um, when you're trying to get hold of people, if you think about daily scrums, if you've got multiple projects running at the same time, if you're trying to have a security representative at each one of those daily scrums, and for most organizations, that's probably going to be unrealistic. Um, if you then try to, to do it in sprint retrospectives, that's also quite tricky to be able to attend everyone. Um, and then you sort of look at maybe integrating into some phase delivery, but when you think about those teams being having and being empowered to get things done, to make decisions, and you've got small teams that are working together, then it's really important that they have the tools and they also have the security knowledge. And sometimes 
what isn't done that well is having that security architecture and thinking about it from the beginning and, and often having the knowledge to, to make the right decisions on the way along. So especially when you've got kind of quick iterative um, development going on, it can be quite a challenge. I also find that often security gets put in a bit later. It's not necessarily during the discovery phase. Um, often people are a bit concerned because they don't necessarily fully know what they're delivering yet. So when you're talking about security, that kind of raises some alarm bells for them. Um, and then there's kind of a, a little bit of an inflexibility towards myself and my colleagues and how we work and how we work with other people in this area. So thinking about third parties and risk, I mean, everyone here will be familiar, I would have thought, with the majority of these incidents, and there are pretty much, I would say, almost every incident has some element of third party that's causing it. But when you think about things like the big target breach back in 2013, then... Um, th the, with that particular incident, it was actually a, a HVAC organisation that's doing their refrigeration that needed to get into the network, and that was the vector that the attacker used to get in. Um, with Talk Talk, um, I don't know how many people here were affected by the breach. Perhaps, probably, I imagine quite a few anyway. The, um, certainly back in 2014, they had an issue with where they were using a and outsourcing some of the their support to a company in India and they were, well, effectively using some of that information to defraud people, as well as the other incident later where I believe it was a third party that created the website as well. So, And then just last year we had not pet year, we, we had a ransomware attack where they were utilising accountancy software updates. Um, that was obviously a very big breach when it came to the types of organisations that it was affecting, like um, energy companies and nuclear banking, that kind of thing, and aviation. Um, and then there was quite an interesting one last year in the Australian Domino's, maybe not for the information that was stolen, but because it was actually a third party supplier that no longer worked for them anymore, but still had their information. So it's just an element of, um, another element of risk, really, around third party assurance. So. The types of things that, which are good things that we do about this is things like compliance. So we look for different certifications. We look for PCI DSS, the payment card. We look for 27001, people with cyber essentials. But if you think about a lot of those organisations before, quite a few of them will have had those certifications, but yet still had incidents. Um, and I think when you think about GDPR and some of the way, some of the higher fines and also some of the expectation from from people and their personal information, they certainly are going to expect more than someone just having a certification. We also do assurance questionnaires, and I've sent these out, sometimes with like a, over 100 questions, and people are filling them in. And really, dependent on how good they are at filling them in, it can be quite interesting. But And it is definitely a useful tool, but it doesn't necessarily get us to the result where we're really getting more secure systems. I mean, some examples of, in, of things I've seen recently, when, when you ask an organisation what they do around vetting their personnel when they've got new starters, they'll say things like, well, LinkedIn's very good these days, we just look them up. And those type of comments, I think it just shows a, a lack of awareness as to why I'm asking those questions. Um, and that's partly why I think that approaching this in a slightly different way can really help certainly a small team to understand what those risks are. But, but these are all definitely good things to do as well. So I'm going to talk a little bit about attack trees now. Now, attack trees have also been around for a long time. So apparently, a lot of these things are never new. <laughs> there is something I've been familiar with for a long time, but not something I'd really thought of using till recently. Um, I think Bruce Schneier originally coined the term, but they were used. Oh, I think there was other other people had discussed. I think Edward Monzo had talked about something similar a bit earlier as well. So they provide a formal methodological way of describing the security of a system. Um, based on varying attacks, so you represent the attacks against a system using a tree structure with a goal at the root and nodes and different ways of achieving that goal. Now, I guarantee, and you can kind of see up in the top right, well, possibly, that <laughs> there's an example here that Bruce uses, which is around 
just opening a safe. So you've got to open a safe, so you could pick the lock, you could learn the combination, you, sh you could cut open the safe, or you may have um, badly installed the safe, and then you can drill down into whether these are probable or improbable. Um, and it's a really simple thing to do. It's something that my eight-year-old niece was looking at the other day, and she had no problem in coming up with a similar tree to this for a safe. Um, talking about biometrics, she was then wanting a fingerprint safe for some reason. But, she <laughs> but I mentioned some of the vulnerabilities, and then she wanted the thousand-pound fingerprint safe. I don't know why an eight-year-old needs to find that, but um, but it's it can be, I think, quite an easy way of um, just documenting something and ba basically just brainstorming some forms of attacks. Because if you've got a multidisciplinary team, like you will have in, the, in an Agile project, and you've got suppliers there with many different people from different backgrounds, then they're going to come up with different things than you're going to come up with. And you can also add to it as time goes on as well. So attack trees are reusable, they're collaborative, um, they're hands-on, so they're a little bit more aligned with the way that people tend to like to work. Um, they're a good way to learn about the system as well, because I noticed that if you do them in the discovery phase, and it obviously raises loads of questions about how people misunderstood the requirements, or they weren't quite sure what they were actually delivering. So, and it can be quite a fun thing to do. Um, and I think I've snuck in a picture of my dog there, but mostly because it had some trees in it, but <laughs> that was... So now going on to, I'm mostly here today to talk about my experience of working with two different suppliers. So the platform that we're delivering is, is a greenfield. We've got nothing there already. We're going out to brand new suppliers to deliver specific capabilities that we can then replace and reuse as time goes on. Um, and what what I did was to look at. We basically had two suppliers running at the same time. There are many. There are a few more suppliers. We're also um, going through the process of procuring at the moment. But the the approach that I took was to do a, like a couple of hours or an hour and a half workshop with each of them, um, and to try the idea of using attack trees. So we went through it during the discovery phase. Um, so they were already doing workshops with different areas. Um, and then we documented these. Um, so the two different suppliers were quite different from each other. One of them was based in the UK and had worked with us before. They were quite flexible and keen to try new approaches. They weren't really worried about this type of methodology. Um, there were some interesting questions, um, but they they didn't seem to have too many concerns. I sent them some information ahead of time. With the other supplier, they were near shore, um, and so therefore they were outside of the UK, which meant that we were doing the workshops over a WebEx environment, which was a bit tricky. Um, culturally, they preferred to know a lot more information first, and they would they wanted a bit more structure about what we wanted to achieve out of it. So both suppliers liked using the, the method of using attack trees to model the requirements. Um, certainly the first supplier, when it came to, to talking to their chief security officer afterwards, he said he'd never seen a document produced that was as good as what got produced out of the result of that. So w what we did is we did the attack trees, but then what I did after that was get them to look at the nodes down and, and actually document what those mitigations were. So as well as looking at the cloud security principles in their design documentation, they had to document what those mitigations were. I then reviewed that document and got them to add some, think about it a bit more. Um, and we're using that as kind of a working document as time goes on. So in between each of the phases, we then review it and we always have a design review anyway um, so I'm kind of using this as more of a really practical approach to security looking at this individual system that they're developing for us and then the potential attacks to it and what they're going to do about mitigating it they they I found that depending on the personality of the people in the group some people wanted to offer solutions all the time they wanted to well we'll do this so that will never happen which is really good because they can then document that in there but i had to kind of explain that we just need to make sure we document all of them um they had uh, certainly were sometimes a little bit concerned they didn't have enough of their own security team there but i think we got around all of that where i started to gain well you you understand this system let's look at what type of information you've got let's look at the types of attacks that could happen against the system and then we can always review it afterwards and work with it 
The, with the second supplier, because they were near shore and we were trying to do it over WebEx, that was, didn't work out, but then we had a site visit afterwards and so we did it with them there and then it worked well. The, they certainly, their test engineer really loved it um, because from a test engineer's point of view, it's, it's really good. They can have documented forms of attacks and then they can use those to actually scope their tests later. They would have preferred, I think, to have a bit more of a blueprint to start with on the types of attacks, um, and that seems fair enough. So some of the lessons that I probably learned from this was I, I tried to use some really simple objectives. So the two simple objectives that we used, and we started in discovery, was to attack the Met Office using this particular capability, and then attack uh, customers using it, just to get them to think slightly differently on an internal or external point of view. <coughs> I think if you had multiple attack trees, then it would be hard to maintain in the future, so this was um, an approach that, that I used that I think worked quite well. I think it's really important that that document gets kept up to date and some of the challenges around resourcing is, is one of those issues that if there isn't somebody there looking over the shoulder all the time and saying, have you updated it, then it, you know sometimes it could get left. Um, I think certainly doing web workshops over WebEx is a, is a difficult thing to do and not something that I'd recommend. <laughs> But maybe that's some of the facilities that we have in place. Um, I would definitely get someone to, to assign a scribe if you want them to write down the go, but you could just take a photo of it if not. Um, think about the people that are attending, so don't just have the technical attacks. You can maybe have some people who are going to represent the more personnel security side of it a bit more and think a bit widely, more widely about it, or even business people as well and the scientists so that they can really understand why we ask these daft questions half the time and, and why we're doing it. Um, I mean, my own approach is generally to assign bribery a little bit as well, but I do think they enjoyed the session, so I don't think sweets are as necessary as sometimes, but, but I, and I also think you need to be quite flexible, so it's not going to work for every supplier, definitely sure of that. Um, and if a supplier is, for example, remote, then it might not be the best option to use. Um, but from, from a personal point of view, and maybe because I'm a bit more of a hands-on type of person, I found this was a lot more engaging for the teams. I think they understood some of the risks a lot better, um, and I think that I got some better information out of it and also got them to think a bit more widely. So to summarise here, and I'll have a look and see if this video is going to work afterwards, but it's just two minutes long. Um, I think we need to get better at third party assurance. It's clearly obvious, every, uh, pretty much every incident has got some issue around third party assurance. This is more around those bigger projects which are, are outsourced to a third party supplier to deliver. Um, but it could equally apply to other areas as well. The, I don't think that we as security professionals are working as collaboratively as we could with our suppliers. I think that the approach in the past has been very much like we send a questionnaire, we ask questions during the tender, we do a risk assessment, um, but we're not working as close as we could with our suppliers and, and that's something that I think we could do a lot better. Um, we should adapt our approach to the people we're working with. So if they're working in multidisciplinary teams and they're working to achieve a goal in this way, then why aren't we doing the same with them? Um, and I also wanted to thank, because the what sparked off some of this idea in my head was that there was a talk by the student load company at Cyber UK last year and they were talking about using attack trees to model the, all of their systems internally. Um, and when I wanted to apply a different approach to working with suppliers, I thought I could use the same methodology. Um, and also, obviously, to Bruce Schneier the point. I am just going to see whether I can get this to load. But
so when you've just watched a brief video about the metal versus big data challenge, um, part of what we put in recently, and when I've put a very simple big pipe in here, it's actually a direct connect link to AWS. So it's two 10 gigabits per second link, which we've been digging up roads and getting our models out to an environment that we can then start utilizing. And um, it's really exciting for us at the moment because we're actually pushing some technologies to the to limits of what they can achieve, trying to get um, um, working with our scientists to do some post-processing on that data and getting sub-second response times to, to queries that we've never been able to do before. Um, so I just wanted to kind of highlight that as being part of what we're delivering in, in my area at the moment, but this is around making the use out of the, the companies that really understand this technology and can really exploit it to the best that we can um, so that we can produce specific products for some of our customers, sometimes utilizing their own data as well. Thank you very much. Annette.